Hey guys, uh, this is Tammy Chambliss here. Uh, I have another video uh, ready for um, uh, the MEIC strategy, Multiple Entry Iron Condor. And I just wanted to share with you a few tips and tricks that I'm uh, using when I'm trading. And uh, maybe this will help you out uh, if you've started uh, trading MEIS. Uh, it's an interesting strategy, and um, I've, uh, I've been very productive with it, uh, very profitable with it uh, so far this year. I've been trading it for almost a year now. Uh, coming up in August will be one year. So learned a lot in that time, and I want to share with you uh, things that I've uh, uh, come across. So I am going to share my screen here. And uh, hopefully you can see that. And uh, I'll talk about uh, the, the techniques that I've learned over this year. And you can always email me and get a copy of this PowerPoint. Uh, so I'll, I'll gladly share that with you. So let me see if I can um, get it uh, from the beginning. Page down. Uh, there we go. Okay. So here's what I'm going to cover. I'll just outline the basic strategy again, uh, determining, uh, uh, show you how I determine position sizing, uh, show you a distribution of daily results, both from back testing and how my results compare to that. And then uh, a little bit about entry times. Um, and then types of stops. I always talk about stops because they're very important in zero DTE strategies. And I'll also add uh, some information in this video. The, these are some tips that I'm going to share on how to turn a profit on break-even trades. Uh, that's something I've learned just by trading. And I'll talk about that uh, some, and some other things, uh, how to how to turn a profit on break-even trades. And then I'll, I'll uh, give you some uh, resources on backtesting too. So uh, just again, this strategy is a result of a lot of backtesting and working with others to figure out what's going to work in this, strat in this market. I didn't originate this strategy, but I've built on the work of others. And uh, generally, I think everybody that uh, everybody that I know of that trades this strategy has found their own way to trade it so they can uh, they they make something work for them and I encourage you to do that this is what I present here is how I trade it it's not by by all means it's not the only way to trade it uh, as I said I've live traded this since August 2022 so I'm coming up on about a year of experience with it um, and the following information shows my research and what I've learned. Uh, I am sharing this for information only. This is not for trade recommendations, uh, but uh, just sharing my experience with you. Uh, you may find other things that improve this strategy. Uh, I, I certainly don't have a monopoly on the market on, on how to trade this. So um, again, this is what how I trade this strategy. So the basics are I enter um, multiple tranches uh, on a regular interval, uh, enter iron condors in multiple tranches uh, on a, a regular interval, basically every 30 minutes starting at around 1 p.m. Eastern time. And that's what I'm trading right now. That can vary because entry time results can vary depend on, depending on market conditions. Uh, and currently I'm entering five tranches just because I'm starting late and that's all I can enter if I'm entering every 30 minutes and, and that's all I could enter more if I wanted to, but uh, that's enough for me. Uh, then I enter into an iron condor using put and call credit spread. So I enter each side separately. I don't enter it all as one iron condor. And that way I can control the prices on each side better. And uh, often I will, I keep a one minute chart of SPX up on the screen and I'll look at that chart to see what direction we're moving or what the latest candle is. 
and usually I'll enter the side we're moving away from first. So that gives me, uh, uh, so I'm not entering and the price is moving toward me. I'm entering and the price is moving away from that uh, that strike. So uh, then in that case, if we get a big candle in one direction, I'm entering on the other side, and then I may give it a minute to, to settle down before I enter the other side and do a little bit of price improvement. I usually target, uh, in my first video, I said I targeted a minimum of 125. Well, after in uh, May and June and now, uh, this is July 2023, it got hard to collect a $1.25 minimum credit. So uh, I will collect what I can on each side. I'll, I'll put it that way. You're welcome to trade further out. You're welcome to trade closer in. This is just what I do. But I generally, you know, early, in my earlier trades, I can get, you know, $1.40, $1.30, but in the late trades later in the day, sometimes it's down to 80 cents or 70 cents. You know, I just get what I can get. And um, I try to collect equal credits on both sides or similar credits on both sides. So I don't want to get, you know, 80 cents on one side and a dollar fifty on the other. So and I'll explain that uh, a little later. So I do try to get equal credits. Um then I typically sell somewhere between a 10 point wide and 30 point wide spread. And I vary the width so that I can control that credit. Uh, that, and I'll go into that in a little bit. So in my first video, I think I was selling 25 wide spreads. Well, I've, I don't, now the way I trade it, I don't always sell a 25 wide trade. That, that trade, that may be my starting point, but uh, when I'm looking for credits, but I'll adjust up or down as I need to. And then I set a one time, uh, a one X net stop uh, on each side. So that's setting the stop at two times the initial credit as the basic stop. And that gives you a one X net loss on each side if you got stopped out. And I set separate stops on each side. So I manage each side separately. So those are the basics. Now I will say on, on entering trades, watch out for uh, overlapping strikes. Uh, I've had some emails uh, from people who say, hey, I entered a trade and then when I entered my second one, I accidentally closed my first one. So um, be sure to pay attention to where you're entering and make sure you're not accidentally closing a short strike with your new long position or vice versa. Uh, and if you are, just move out a strike. If, you know, if you're overlapping a, a short and a long strike, so just move out, um, out a strike. So you don't want to accidentally close a position uh, with something that you've entered um, or with your, with your next trade. Uh, so, um, this is the basic risk graph. Oops, uh, there. The basic risk graph, and uh, just talking about selling roughly twenty-five wide spreads, selling a put and a call, uh, and then uh, and they don't have to be equal distance from the current stock price. I don't really pay attention to that. I'm just paying attention to credits. And then uh, this shows that I'm using the uh, a 2x stop for a 1x net loss. So, you know, if I'm collecting a $1.25 credit, if I use a, a, if I set my stop at two times the initial credit, uh, my loss would be uh, 125 uh, on that side. So now if you lose on one side, you're winning on the other. So that is a break even trade. So at the end of the day, let's say the stock market goes down and it, it stops you out of all of your puts, uh, but you still have all your calls on. That's a break even day. And uh, in this strategy, uh, roughly 35 for 30, 35 percent of the days are break even days. There are a lot of stop outs with this strategy and that's unnerving to some people. But after a while, 
you gain some trust in this in this uh, approach, you're spreading out your uh, trades among multiple entries. So you're spreading your risk among multiple entries. Some of those trades are going to succeed. Some of those trades are going to get stopped out. So it's just part of the game on this strategy. And then uh, I always reiterate this uh, about uh, never risking more than 2% of your account on any one trading day. And that would be a total of all of your MEIC trades, and if you got stopped out on all of them, that would not exceed more than 2% of your account. Now, I actually like to keep that down to more like one, one and a half, um, but that's just based on my account size. If you have a smaller account, that's harder to do, but you know, two, two and a half percent might be fine with a smaller account. So um, the other thing that I always watch is, um, making sure uh, that um, that I don't exceed uh, more than 50% of my buying power. I pay attention to buying power on this uh, because we're entering multiple trades. So, um, uh, but the rest of this slide shows an example of not risking more than 2%. So let's say I have a $100,000 account, 2% of that is 2,000. And I set up the trade so that if I lose on all trades on both sides, which is pretty rare, it can happen, but it's very rare, then that, that uh, loss won't exceed 2% of the account. So if I get $1.50 for each side, credit for each side, and I'm entering six, uh, six tranches, that's $300 for an iron condor times six, is $1,800. If I lost every trade, I'd lose that amount. You know, there can be some slippages, slippage on that and there are fees associated with that. But So it's a rough number, but I try to make sure that's less than 2% of my account. And then I know I'm, um, you know, sure, I hate to lose that amount, but I know my account is safe. I'm not gonna blow out my account. So always good to, uh, cover that. So here's something I'm going to share with you guys. I created this QR uh, code that you can uh, capture with your phone. And, uh, and if you get the PDF file, there's a link here uh, to that same file. But this is a calculator that uh, you can use uh, to uh, check out your um, your, uh, your, the percentage of buying power and the uh, risk that's on your account. Now I'm gonna switch over and uh, stop sharing this and start sharing a, a um, let's see, where can I get that? Just a second. Need to see my, For some reason, there we go. Uh, let me share this screen. Sorry for the delay here. Where? I see where I'm, I'm off. So uh, share screen. There share that Excel file. So this is that Excel file live. So I can edit this and I'll show you how to use it. Um, so you should be seeing my uh, Excel screen right now. And uh, let's say you have a $50,000 account and you don't wanna risk more than 50% of your buying power. And uh, let's say uh, you enter uh, five tranches and two contracts, let's see if that's enough. So uh, spread width of 25, um, it looks like the results of that are no, I need to reduce something. So uh, let's say if I enter four tranches and two contracts on each of those tranches, that's okay. I'm not using more than 50% uh, of my buying power. Um, and I could 
uh, let's see if I if I can vary the spread width and increase the number of tranches, that's okay. Let's see if I can go up to six now. Yeah, so there. So I could enter six tranches, two contracts a piece in, in a $50,000 account. That's, that's not using more than 50% of my buying power. And, and there's a reason for that. And I'll show, I'll, I'll explain how we're gonna, why we need that extra buying power uh, a little later. So the average credit per, si per side, if we get a dollar twenty, and this can vary per day, and it varies. You know, like at the beginning of this year, I was getting about a dollar forty credit average. Lately, it's been closer to a dollar credit average. So let's, or maybe a dollar five. So let's put in a dollar five. If I'm getting a dollar five, and I'm trading two contracts then I'm risking, and six tranches, I'm risking $2,500, which is 5% of my account. So that's too much. So let's go, let's back off of that and say, let's enter one contract. So that's still a little high. So uh, I may need to back off to five tranches and that's getting closer. So five tranches, uh, if my average credit is around $1.05, uh, then that's okay. And uh, I would not, you know, 2.1% is close enough. So you can use this calculator, you know, if we had a $30,000 account, which is even smaller, um, you know, you might need to go uh, to four tranches instead of uh, five to just reduce that credit a little, or reduce your risk a little bit. So that risk, and you may also need to reduce, let's say if you went to $90 uh, credit or, I mean, a 90 cent credit or even 80 cent credit average, you know, that would get you down to 2%. But like I said, with a smaller account, you may need to, you may need to risk a little more in order to do this strategy. But I, this is available for your use. It's online and uh, feel free to make a copy of it, download it and use it for as a guide to help you with your strategy. Now I'm gonna uh, stop sharing that screen and go back to sharing this screen. Okay, so let me get my screen set up here. Okay. There we go. Okay, so that's how that works. And that'll be a guide for you in trading this. And I use this, you know, you don't have to check it all the time. Just check it occasionally as your account grows, hopefully. And uh, you can see if you can bump up in trading and, and um, uh, bump up in the number of contracts or the number of tranches. Um, and it's always good to uh, increase. If you can trade the higher credits, that's, that's always good to um, uh, up to a certain limit. Now, this is a slide I showed in my original presentation on January 13th on this strategy. And I just present this as a reminder that roughly uh, in this this was based on back testing of this strategy and uh, roughly 24% um, uh, of the days, 25% of the days were break even days, 58% were profitable days and 16% were losing days. So let's see how that's changed uh, now in live uh, trading, if it has. And so, um, now, there we go. Um, here's results through May. And um, the results are pretty similar to that. I probably had a little higher. I think there were 16% losing days. And January through May, it's been 23% losing days. Uh, but roughly... 42% of the days are winning days. So there's more winning days and losing days. That's always good with a, with a 1x stop because you're, you're losing about the same amount that you're winning on winning days. So more winning days means higher profits. 
but there's something that I observed here uh, with 35% of the days being break even days. Um, if we can find a way to turn those break even days, that's where you lose, you win on half of your trades and you lose on half. So it's essentially break even. If we can find a way to make a little profit on those break even days, then that can help our overall profits. So that's something that I've been working on. And, and uh, just through live trading this, I've worked out a technique uh, that will allow me to do that. And let's see if I can, okay. So, uh, well, I, I'll go into that in a minute, but uh, another discussion here, are some entry times better than others. Yes, there are some entry times um, that are better than others. And it will change throughout the year. Some, sometimes morning volatility is, is high and the afternoon trades work out better. Sometimes uh, afternoon volatility is high and maybe the morning trades work out better or you get higher credit in the morning and maybe it'll make it through the afternoon volatility. But um, uh, I... I suggest just entering at a regular interval each day. Some people start uh, in the morning and enter every hour. Uh, and I uh, start in the afternoon and enter every 30 minutes. And I'll show you why. I do some testing on, um, on those entry times and see what, what works out best. So, um, uh, Near the end of the day, if you're using a target credit, your trade is going to be closer and closer to the money, and you probably will be collecting less and less credit throughout the day, just something to be aware of. Uh, the morning trades, definitely, you can collect a little more credit, uh, but, but you've also got to uh, stick through the whole day, and sometimes that's tough to do. So um, if I always do a study. Uh, and I do this each month, I look at three time periods. I'm just showing two time periods here. I look at three time periods. One, I look at the past couple of years uh, through the current, the, the most recent month. And then I look at this, the last six months. Uh, in this case, it's January through June to see what time periods are working well. And then I look at the last month to see what the trend might be. And I originally, when I was talking about this strategy in my first video, I was entering around uh, noon um, Eastern time and entering every 30 minutes. Well, it was in May and June that those middle, middle time periods just started not performing as well. And uh, so I don't know exactly what's going on there, but I have since changed my times to enter later. I did uh, try entering mornings for a while, but I just found that uh, I wasn't making it through the whole day with those trades. So uh, lately I've been, in, I've been starting around one o'clock Eastern time and just entering every 30 minutes. Now I don't necessarily worry about, um, you know, at 3.30 in June, that, cre that produced a, a, a return or a, a CAR, compounded annual return of 3.9% versus 25% for 3.15. I don't worry about that so much. Um, I just try to get a scattering of time periods in there and try to pick some of those high performing times and, and, but those high performing times can change. It's kind of like uh, chasing returns and mutual funds. Uh, you chase the return and, and you miss out on the, on the best performers because you're picking what performed well last year. Um, same thing with time periods. So just choose a smattering of time periods. And uh, also I will say, uh, I give links to um, a Facebook group and a Discord group uh, at the end of the video. And I do this update every month and I post these results. So uh, you're welcome to use my back testing on this. It takes several hours to do this 
uh, back testing where I'm looking at it by hour or by by every 15 minutes, basically, and doing it on several time periods. Down here at the bottom, I show the averages and the eight best times. If you pick the eight best times in that time category, what kind of car uh, you would have and what kind of Calmar uh, you have. I usually uh, pick it based on Calmar uh, because uh, if, if you look up Calmar or Mar, it's very similar to Mar, uh, it takes the return and divides it by the drawdown. So it, it looks, you don't want a strategy that re returns 26% if your drawdown is also 26%. That would be a Calmar of one. And uh, you want a high Calmar ratio. So I, I look at um, kind of the average of what I'm all time periods. And then I look at the eight best times and try to choose something, you know, a scattering of those eight best times um, for my entry times. So hopefully that helps. And then by updating that and, and giving that, giving you access in the Facebook group and in Discord, and you can join either one or both if you want. Um, and I know a lot of you are already in those and, and I appreciate your attendance. And so uh, another thing about stops, I always talk about stops because they're so important. A market stop order, you set the price at which the stop triggers and the broker closes at whatever price they can get. So you're, you're not guaranteed your price with a stop limit order. I mean, with a stop market order, it can be over the price. But I've found very often it's it's right at my trigger or five cents over the trigger. It's not far off. Same thing with the stop limit order. With stop limit, you set the price at which the stop triggers and you set the maximum price you're willing to pay to close. What I do is I set the stop for two times the initial credit. And so like if I... Uh, got a credit of a dollar, I would set the stop for $2 plus, uh, so that's the trigger for $2. And then I would uh, add 30 to 40 cents more for the limit. I give it a lot of room because you don't want the stop limit order to be blown through and not get you out. Um, if, if you can't watch the market, use a stop market, a market stop rather than a stop limit order. I'd only use a stop limit order if you can watch it because, uh, oh, I'd say using this technique, I'd say maybe once every two weeks uh, on, you know, I'm entering five or six trades a day uh, in three different accounts and all that, I may have one stop limit order be blown through, you know, so it doesn't happen very often. This works pretty well but it's still, it's painful if it does happen and you don't see it, you can have a big loss. There's another way to do it, set stop on condition. So if, if the stock hits a certain price, you would exit the short uh, legs or exit the trade. Manual stop, don't do them. That's where you set a price mentally at which you would get out and you enter a market order to exit. It's by far the worst performer. You cannot act fast enough in a fast moving market to get out um, unless you're sitting there with your finger on the trigger. And you can't sit there with your finger on the trigger if you've got five trades on the line and you've got to get out of all five in a split second. So uh, please use stop orders. And I often get emails from people who have used a manual stop and they've had big losses and I feel for them, but you've got to use stop orders on zero DTE trades. So um, how I use a stop limit order is, uh, let's say I got a dollar fifty for the calls, a dollar sixty for the puts. I set the stop on the call side for $3 and the limit at 330. And I set the stop on the put side for 320 and the limit at 360. So 30 to 40 cents more. Um, about an hour, this is very important, this next point, about an hour before the close or sometimes even sooner, 
those sh long legs become worth less than five cents. When that happens, those legs are not tradable. And if you have a spread with one of those worthless legs in it, your stop will not fill on that spread. You can be $5 over your stop and have a stop market. It won't fill um, if those legs are worthless. So uh, please, uh, when you notice that those legs are worth, usually, um, at least in my broker, they go to two and a half cents or uh, the midpoint is two and a half cents. And that just tells me that it's time to convert my spreads. So I convert the spread, the stops from a stop on the spread to a stop on the short leg. And that way my risk is just on the short leg. And that short, depending on the fluctuation of that store, short leg, um, I, it'll get me out. Now, also, I will set a market stop at that point. I won't use a stop limit order because near the end of the day, bid ass spreads will widen out, especially as those uh, strikes approach the money. The bid ass spread gets wider and wider. So it gets tougher and tougher to uh, fill those. So um, I, I usually, uh, convert to a stop on the short leg, and then I tighten my stop to a minimum of a dollar on those. Let's say the uh, the value of the uh, of this of the short leg is thirty cents, and uh, or twenty cents, whatever. I will still set my stop for a market stop to get me out if the price gets back to a dollar. Now, a dollar is usually less than the initial credit I got, so I should get some profit on that. Um, but I will never set it to less than three times the current price of the short leg. If the short leg is 50 cents, I will set that stop for a dollar fifty instead of a dollar, just to give it a little more room. Um, but again, I usually will try to keep the new stop at at least the credit that I got for the trade so that I can make a little bit of money on that if I get stopped out. Um, and then don't use a stop limit order if you can't watch the market. You occasionally will get blown through, like I said. So uh, let me go change slides here. There. Now, to talk about a new technique that I've been working on, and it works pretty well, and a lot of people have started trading this. Uh, it's a technique to make money on what would end up as an otherwise break-even trade. This only works with using a 1x stop. That's that's a 1x net stop. Your loss is a 1x loss. It won't work on a 1.5x stop or greater. And, the, and that, that's because what we're doing is we're taking a break-even trade and we're just trying to eke out a little bit of profit on that break-even trade. If you use a 1.5x stop and do this technique, you'll have a little smaller loss, but you'll still have a loss. What I'm doing is trying to take the 35% of those break-even trades and create a profit on that. So in order for this to work, ideally you want matching credits on each side of the trade, or I'd say within 10 cents of each other. You don't want the credits to be, you know, $1.40 on one side and 90 cents on the other. It's just too, too much difference to make this work. Um, but sometimes that's difficult to to achieve, so I have a way to, to uh, work around that uh, if that happens. But the goal when you're entering the trade is to get as close a credit as you can on each side to make this work. And then, um, so on this trade, if we can take those 35% of the trades that are break even, and, uh, and this strategy uh, we'll take those trades, 35% of our trades, and turn them into a small profit, that can earn you roughly $50 to $60 if you're trading five to six entries 
on a day that would have been break even. So uh, it can give you a little money in your pocket if we're at least participating in the market. And I have found over time that this boosts my profits by about 15% compared to not using this technique. And this is just from January to July, uh, la July 14th, so last Friday. Um, uh, just looking at what kind of improvement am I getting in these trades. And um, so without using Mies, uh, I had a certain profit with using Mies, uh, uh, Mies Plus. Um, and Mies Plus is this technique that I'm talking about. Uh, I made an average of about $50 a day extra profit per tray per day. And that totaled about $1,700 profit for the year so far. So about 15% uh, improvement, which is pretty significant. So I'll take that uh, over a break-even trade. So here's what you do. The, the idea of, of this uh, credit is, or this technique is, I get the same credit on each side. And, and as you start trading this, um, uh, as you start trading MEIC, and you will get better at learning techniques for how to get the same credit on each side. You'll get very good at being, a, excuse me, being able to set, select the short strikes and select the long strikes. And um, you can adjust the credit, the width, a number of contracts. There's all kinds of things you can manipulate to adjust the price. So what I do is uh, first determine the credit uh, on each side. And then when I'm se setting, if I collect the same credit on each side, this is the basic concept. I determine the stop for two times the initial credit. And then I subtract 10 cents from that stop. So if I get $1.20 on both sides, I multiply by two to get my stop. So that would be uh, 2.40 and subtract 10 cents for that. So on each side, instead of my setting my stop for 2.40 and that's the stop trigger, I set the stop trigger for 2.30 on each side, slightly less. And then if I get stopped on one side, I'll collect that I collect total for the trade $1.20 times two. So I collected $2.40 on both sides. I had a loss of $2.30 because I got stopped out on one side. I made 10 cents or $10 on a break even trade. If I do that five or six times a day, that's 50 or $60 a profit per contract that I'm trading. So that's a pretty, a pretty, big game changer for me. I found this out by accident because E-Trade, I use E-Trade as a broker and my fills on E-Trade are very good. And sometimes I was getting filled for five cents less than the stop I was setting. I was originally setting it, it's 2X. And I noticed on those trades, I would make a profit because of the credits on both sides. So um, think about this, this slide a little bit and run these numbers for yourself and understand this concept that if you reduce your stop on one side, <coughs> on both sides, and you stop out on one side, then your stop is a little less than the total credit you're taking in, um, even using a 1x stop. So that's what makes this Mies Plus work. Now, there's several ways to do it. When I am trading manually, I can manipulate the width of the spread. I can manipulate the number of contracts to get the same total credit on each side. I have a selection of strikes and premiums to choose from when trading options. And I can adjust the width on one side uh, to get the premium on that side closer to the premium on the other side. <laughs> now by entering, excuse me, let me take a drink here. And that is a soft drink. <laughs> um, by entering 
one side first and then the other side, you kind of have to pay attention to what you might get on both sides before you enter. And then you enter that side. And then you, uh, once you get that credit, then you've got a target credit to get for the other side. And that works pretty well. I'm, I'm very often able to get the same credit or very close to the same credit. And um, so I check both sides first. I like to enter the side we're moving away from first. So, and this gives me time to select my strikes and match the credit as closely as possible. So take your time, uh, uh, try to get these credits uh, very similar. In the next slide, I'll show you exactly how it's done. So uh, let's say we've got um, on, and uh, this is just an example uh, option chain. We've got the 410 calls here going for 120 and the 485 calls uh, puts, sorry, 4485 puts going for 110. But when you're selecting the short strike, you've got, you know, you can go out a little less on that higher side credit, go out a little further on the lower side credit. So if I use the 4510s, get $1.20 and the 4520, and let's say I can buy that for 30 cents, that's a 10 wide spread and that's 90 cents credit. So that's, that's within my tolerance. That's the basic idea of how to do that. Then on the other side, I've got a dollar ten credit. So how can I get a dollar ninety? So I'm looking for something around twenty cents. So that would be the forty four sixty five strike. So that selling the forty four eighty five puts and buying the forty four sixty five puts for twenty cents gives me a ninety cent credit. On, on the put side as well. So one side is a 10 wide spread, one side is a 25, a 20 wide spread. Now I will vary those. Uh, usually I don't have to vary them too much, but be aware of your buying power, especially if you have a smaller account, you've, you don't have much room, but you know, you can always go narrower like this. It's just when you have to go wider, that's the the issue, you know, there there could have been other selections here to get a little more credit and go wider, um, but this is this is an example of how how I do it. Then let's say you just can't get the same credit on both sides for some reason, or you don't. So um, I have traded this where um, I'm trading automated trading, and I don't have much control over the credits I get on both sides. So there I have to do something a little bit differently. Um, it uh, And I, I can't really do this in automated trading, but in manual trading, you can vary the number of contracts. So if you're getting a high credit on one side and a low, like, like let's say we're going for the 4490s and we got in those and um, I got the 44.65 for 20 cents. So my total credit is $1.80. Then, then I'm going to the calls and I've got to get $1.80 out of this. Well, I don't really want to go to Delta 30 to trade that and, and select that. It feels a little too close to the money. So I may go to the $1.45 for, for $1.20 and instead of one contract, do two contracts. And then I buy the uh, 4520 for 30 cents again. And uh, so two times that, two contracts is $1.80. So I'm trading one contract on one side, two contracts on the other. Uh, so I am a little off balance by uh, true risk, but the, the dollar amount of the risk is the same on both sides. So that's how I get uh, similar credits. I will vary uh, both the width of the spread and sometimes the number of contracts in order to get those credits to be the same. Now, uh, here are some requirements. You've got to have plenty of available buying power to increase the width of the spread. Um, so, you know, if you're if you are doing this, just pay attention to that. And if you especially if you've got a small account, uh, if, and then if you've got plenty of 
you've got to have plenty of buying power to vary the number of contracts on each side as well. So because you're going to have off-balanced iron condors, the buying power is going to be greater on one side than the other. So uh, that's why when you're initially estimating for this trade, you don't want to use more than 50% of your buying power. In, in, in live trading, you may be using more than 50% of your buying power, but, but you're not using much more than that. And um, so even though the width of the spread varies or the number of contracts vary, your risk based on the stop is the same. So, uh, you know, I've got on those trades, I've got either, you know, $1.80 risk on the put side or $1.80 risk on the call side. The risk is the same. Um, so uh, your max loss risk, um, your ultimate mass, max loss risk would be different on each side. If you, if your stops blew out, black swan event, you would have two contracts on one side that went to full loss and one contract on the other side that went to full loss. I don't, you can't do that, but um, you know you are varying your the actual max loss risk. But that um, it is an infrequent uh, event, and most of the time, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, your stops are going to get you out. But because you're not risking all of your buying power uh, on any one day, you're not going to blow out your account. You might lose a significant amount, which is another reason to pay attention to the amount of buying power you're using. So be aware of what strikes you're using for previous spreads to avoid accidentally closing along when you enter a new short and vice versa. That's just another thing to be aware of. I think I mentioned that earlier, uh, a little bit unrelated, but uh, there. Um, there are situations where I can't get equal credit on both sides. And uh, one of those is automated trading. And the other might be just the pricing that day is weird. I just can't get equal credit. So there is a way uh, to do this uh, technique, even though you're getting uh, dissimilar credits on each side. So here, uh, excuse me while my, I'm going to mute for a second because my yard man is here. Again. No, can't. Maybe you can't hear them. Okay, so if we get dissimilar credits, so let's say, you know, I'm in automated trading and these, this is just what it's selected. And so I'm in this trade, one contract on each side. I collected $1.75 on one side and $1.35 on the other side. So what can I do in this case? You know, do I just set it for, for 1x, 1x on, uh, or, or two times the initial credit for a 1x net loss on each side? Or is there something I can do? There is something you can do. So uh, let me, so we've got $1.75 one side, 135 the other. So on the higher side, um, what I do is uh, normally I would set that stop at two times that higher side, which would be uh, 350. But in this case, to because I want to stop out and I want to make a little money on that trade, if I stopped out on that side, then I need to reduce the stop so that it's a little below the other side um, and the net credit combined, and I still make a profit. So to set the stop on the high side, and I mean the, the credit, the side you got the higher credit on, I would add the two credits together and then subtract 10 cents. So in this case, my stop would be, I take $1.75 plus $1.35 would be 310 less 10 cents, so $3. And then I, on the other side, I just do my normal thing. I take the credit I got, $1.35, multiply by two and subtract 10 cents. So 
that stop would be instead of 20, 270, it would be 260 stop. So I'll show you how that works if you do the math on that. So if you're stopped out on the high side, we took in a total of $3.10 credit and you're stopped out at $3 on the high side and your other side is a winner. You have $10 of profit. If you stopped out on the low side, you had $3.10 of credit and you stopped out at 260, which is where our stop was on the low side, you have $50 of profit on that trade. So uh, that can work out well in your favor. So you win if you get stopped out on the high side that you got the higher credit of, and you win a little bit bigger more if you get stopped out on the low side. So if you, and also if you got stopped out on both sides, I should add this to this slide. If you got stopped out on both sides, your loss would be a little bit smaller using this technique instead of um, let's say uh, one seven, well, 310. 310 minus, we stop out at uh, $3 on one side and we stop out at 260 on the other side. We're, uh, may not be doing the math right, but I'll say three, uh, 310 minus three minus 2.6. I'd have a, a loss of 250 instead of 310. So my loss, even if I stop out on both sides, is a little bit less. So it's a win-win technique, I think, uh, as long as you're using a 1x stop. Now, a lot of people are using uh, you know, 1.5x stops or 1.5x on one side and uh, a little bit less on, on the other side, 1x on the call side, 1.5x on the put side, doing all kinds of different variations. This technique will only work if you're using a 1x stop on both sides. So another thing that I do that's part of the MIS plus, M-E-I-C plus, is once the long options become worth, worth less than five cents and become untradeable, which I mentioned before, I remove the stop and set the stop on the spread. And I set it to be just a stop on the short leg. So if the short leg is worth less than 30 cents, I'll set the stop, instead of setting the stop to what it was, like let's say it was a $3 stop, then um, instead of setting the stop on the short leg for $3, I'll, and the short leg is only worth 30 cents right now. So if I set my stop to a dollar, then it gives the stock some room to move without stopping me out. And, and it's near the end of the day, it's likely to expire worthless. So I don't really want it to stop out. I don't, I don't wanna set it as close as 50 cents and have it stop out. I'll set it for a dollar minimum and uh, and then hopefully I'll make it through the day and that, that option will expire worthless. If the short leg is worth more than that, like let's say the short leg is worth 50 cents and I set the stop at a dollar, well, that 50 cents could become 75%, 75 cents and 80 cents, you know, as the stock is moving around and I might get stopped out. So if it's worth, more than 30 cents, I will set the stop to three times the current premium for the short leg. So if it's worth 40 cents, my stop is $1.20. If it's worth 50 cents, my stop is $1.50. And then as it becomes worth less as, as theta decays and we get closer to the end of the day, I'll just keep adjusting that and adjust it down to a dollar minimum. Now, there are times, sometimes if that leg is worth only five cents or less, I'll reduce the stop down to 50 cents. If there's a very high likelihood that it will not stop out, it's very far from the money. It's a pretty calm day. I may set it down for 50 cents, but it really doesn't matter. It, the stop isn't going to hit. So um, it's, it, this is just a technique I use. So this way, um, if, if I do stop out on this leg, 
then I will have a smaller stop than I would have just leaving it at, at you know, two times the initial credit or one X stop. So this hopefully will uh, help prevent the dreaded double stops. When you get stopped out on both sides on all trades, this, you know, as your trade because it's like a little like a trailing stop uh, in a sense, um, but we're trying to uh, hold on to a little bit of the profit that we made during the day. And, and if it stops out at a dollar, I'm fine with that, but I have reduced my risk in that trade because I've reduced the stops. Now, um, so like I said, the, the reasoning for tightening is to protect profits while still giving the option move to uh, room to move around, but hopefully it expires worthless. If the stop is hit, uh, usually a dollar stop is not a full loss on that side because if I collected a dollar 80 credit, it could be, you know, I, I keep half of my profits and I avoid a full loss. The downside is sometimes I'll stop out of a trade that would have expired worthless if I'd left a 2x stop on, so or a, one, a full 1x stop. So instead of uh, shifting the stop down to a dollar. So that's the downside. You may have some stop outs on trades that might have expired worthless. So um, uh, just a second, let's see, get back here. Uh, I'm not going to go over a lot of the back testing for this, uh, but I wanted to share again a little bit about back testing because I uh, I think it's very important. I think it's learning how to back test is is I think the single best thing you can do for your trading. If you haven't learned to back test, I really recommend you do because it is so helpful. You can try out ideas without experimenting on your real money. And you can see what works and what doesn't work. And you can learn from that without risking real money. So uh, generally a guide to backtesting is first determine your set of rules, what you wanna, uh, what you wanna uh, trade. Then understand your data set. You know, if, is your data based on uh, end of day data, one minute data or tick pricing? Uh, end of day data is basically useless for zero DTE testing. I wouldn't use it. You can use it for, you know, 45 days to expiration, 60 days to expiration. It will work for that. But still, I don't think it's as good as one minute data for that. But a lot of back testers don't have even one minute data. I think the trend I think people are getting on the bandwagon for one minute data. So hopefully more, more and more backtesters will have that. But the good backtesters, I'll say, have one minute data and it can be used for zero DTE testing. But even one minute data will miss some price action. I found that there was about, it would miss about 5% of the stops in a, in a backtest over several years. It would miss about 5% of the stops because there might be, price action in, within one minute where um, that price uh, went up and hit your stop and then returned, well, the back test missed that stop. And so your results showed a little bit better than what you would have experienced in live trading. So there have there's been one back tester that I know of and maybe more that I'm not aware of that has tick data. That is ideal. That is the closest you can get to live trading. And um, I'll share that in a minute. It's the same thing I talked about, the BYOB, build your own back test. But I'll, I'll give you a link and some information about that. So select a time period to test. Uh, normally what I'll do is I'll, I'll test a short time period and just do a bunch of tests on that short time period. And then I will test over a longer time period. So I'm testing multiple uh, time periods. Now, prior, if you're testing and you're going back to 2000 or 2020 or, or 2000, data before 2011 is not going to include zero DTE uh, data because uh, only monthly options were available 
on SPX uh, prior to 2011. So, and even between 2011 and 2016, there were only Friday expirations every Friday. So it was just weekly trade. So that really is not very good data. I suggest testing really from 2016, about March 2016 was when they added Wednesdays and then Mondays may have been October 2016, but starting to be more data in 2016, 2017. And then of course, if you've been trading zero DTE recently, uh, you know that in April and May, Tuesday and Thursday options, uh, 2022, Tuesday and Thursday options were added. So since May 2022, data using uh, one minute or zero or tick data is going to be testing um, uh, every day of the week. And you have many more occurrences, much better data. I suggest testing one or setting up your rules and then change one variable at a time to see how that affects the results. And if it's improved, then change one more variable and, and continue to improve it until it doesn't improve. And then go back and try modifying something else. And But just changing one variable at a time, you'll know what caused the results in your back test. And, and that will lead you to what is more profitable. And then just continuing changing individual variables until you found the best performing results. And, and then, like I said, run results on different time periods to see if that performance holds up in different markets. So, you know, like recently, we've kind of been in a a bull market run from, uh, I'd say June to current July, mid July here, 2023. And, uh, you know, if you test and find something that works on that time period, well, it may not work from, uh, uh, say, October to January, 2022. I don't know, you'd have to try it, but just, you know, run your your test on different periods and see how it works. And, you know, the longer your test is, the more market variability you're going to have over that test. But you can find within that market periods that mimic what's going on now. Like now we have low volatility. Uh, we've got some market movement um, uh, and we've got high, uh, uh, high SPX levels and low credits. I'll say that uh, credits have been reducing over the past few months. So um, that uh, that just gives you some ideas of things you can test. And here are some links to um, the build your own back test. Uh, this was built specifically for MEIC and iron flies. It works on SPX only. So there is option Omega that's available for, it uses other underlyings, but still it's limited underlyings and they use one minute data. BYOB is free to use. Um, BYOB, uh, straight BYOB, that first link has one minute data from 2016 to 2022, December, 2022. The BYOB ticks has tick data from 2020, January 2020 to current. And they, he is keeping that up to date every day. So you can go back and test yesterday. What would have worked better than what I did yesterday? And just test one day if you want. So I love those back testers. They, they're they just by far the best thing I've ever used. They're very easy to use. And uh, you can test multiple um, parameters, change one parameter at a time. Um, uh, Delta is available in BYOB only. It's not available in the tick data. So you can trade by enter by Delta. Uh, you can determine the number of contracts by a fixed quantity of contracts or a percentage of buying power per entry. You can set stops on stop multiple or profit targets. You can, you know, exit trades early if you want. And the best thing about these is you can set it up to enter multiple times a day without having to rerun a test on each time period um, to 
and, and consolidate your results. It does that for you. You can scroll down and view individual trades and you can export the trade results uh, uh, and or the daily balance and run an equity curve on that. So um, here I have put together a guide for this and I apologize for the long link. I tried to find a way to do a QR code and couldn't find it. So make a screenshot of that and save that uh, and then copy paste that into your um, browser to uh, this takes you to a guide for how to use BYOB and BYOB and BYOB ticks. There's a lot of information in there, tells you specifically what each variable does and, um, and how you wanna use it. And then lastly, uh, it, feel free to email me with any questions you have. Uh, I'm, I'm always open to emails and uh, to responding to emails. I like questions because they give me ideas for things to test. They, they give me feedback for how y'all are doing based on the, the information I'm putting out there. And uh, some things you run into cause me to think, you know, I, I wanna look into that further and maybe do some additional back testing. Now new is I have a new Facebook group that is geared toward zero DTE. Most of us trade zero DTE. Um, I'm moving away from the Tasty Trade uh, Facebook group because of the Tasty Trade branding. I don't like their uh, uh, content on uh, zero DTE trades. I think they're going in the wrong direction with that. So I just split off, created this new group, and a lot of people have joined. I think we've got about a thousand people or so. So it's a good, well-participated uh, Facebook group and Discord group. <clears throat> so here are the links. This link on the Discord group is active until August 15th. Um, if you're watching this video after that date, just email me and I'll send you a new link for the Discord group. And um, we do vet you when you uh, come into the group on the Discord group. So we ask what your trading experience is and how you heard about it. Just say you heard about it from the video. Uh, same thing on the Facebook group. Just say say you saw this link on my video and you, you'd like to join. So Quantum Options Facebook group and Quantum Options Discord group. And hopefully I'm working on a website where I can post links to all my videos and post a lot of the data so that it's all in one place and um, all, all together, but I don't have that ready to go yet, but you can watch for uh, www.quantum-options.com will be the uh, Facebook link, and I mean the website link, and uh, so that's about it for today. So again, this presentation was for informational purposes, it's not investment advice. Uh, so any trade you make on this information are your responsibility. I'll help you out as best I can. Uh, email me and, uh, but please paper trade, paper trade any strategy first until you're comfortable trading it. And uh, don't risk live money until you fully understand all the mechanics of a trade. And, uh, Anyway, best of luck with your strategies, and I appreciate uh, uh, the likes on the videos, and uh, thank you guys for all your support. And let me stop. Stop share in the video.